Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smeeds. Welcome to Abe's video notes for topic 8.6, which will cover thermal pollution. Our objective for the day is to be able to describe the effects of thermal pollution on aquatic ecosystems. And the skill that we'll practice at the end of today's video will involve explaining an environmental concept in an applied context. So before we get into sources of thermal pollution and its effects on organisms, we have to understand the solubility of oxygen in water. So a reminder that solubility is the ability of a solid, liquid, or gas to dissolve into a liquid. In this case, that gas would be oxygen and that liquid would be water. So remember that oxygen is needed by all organisms, even aquatic organisms. So fish even are going to pull oxygen out of the water via their gills. And so it's really critical to understand the relationship between temperature in a water source and the oxygen in that water source. In this case, it's going to be an example of an inverse relationship. So what that means is that as the temperature of water increases, the dissolved oxygen level of that water decreases. We can see this here in a graph. If we take a look at the x-axis as we go up in temperature, we're going to see a drop in the amount of dissolved oxygen that that water can hold. Now, instead of trying to memorize this fact or just commit it to memory, think of an example of a boiling pot of water. So if you put a pot of water on the stove and you turn up the temperature on the stove, eventually that water is going to start to bubble and some of the oxygen molecules are actually going to be leaving the water. You can see little bubbles form and that oxygen has to exit the water because the molecules of water are moving around faster. You can think of them as actually like displacing or bumping out those oxygen molecules. So what does this mean for aquatic ecosystems? Well, this demonstrates how we can have something called thermal pollution occurring in aquatic ecosystems. So when hot water is released into a cooler body of water, it's going to bring up the temperature and therefore it's going to bring down the dissolved oxygen level. Now, organisms that live in this water source are going to actually experience an increase in their rate of respiration. And this is because as less oxygen is available, they're trying to pull in breaths more frequently or pass water over their gills more frequently if they're a fish and trying to just extract as much oxygen as possible. The problem is that there's less oxygen available and that increased respiration rate can cause physiological stress on these organisms. Uh, if it gets bad enough and the dissol dissolved oxygen level gets low enough, organisms can actually suffocate and die. So there can be some pretty dramatic consequences for organisms in a body of water when the body of water undergoes thermal pollution. Now we'll take a look at some sources of thermal pollution. So the biggest source of thermal pollution is power plants. Power plants are going to use cool water from nearby surface waters, either to turn that water into steam, to turn a turbine, to power a generator, to make electricity, or just to cool down the machinery used in this process as it gets really, really hot. So we can see a diagram here where we have this power plant, presumably, uh, right on a coastline. And so they can take in water through this intake valve on the left. And so you can see that's cooler water. But then as that water is heated, either by being turned into steam and then condensing back into water or just being used to cool down hot equipment, it's released back into this surface body of water. And we can see that it's red, so it's much warmer. And remember, that's going to decrease the dissolved oxygen in the water and it could cause thermal shock in the organisms that live here. Now, it's not just power plants. A lot of large manufacturing facilities, things like steel mills or paper mills, also use water to cool down machinery. And so this could happen in a production facility as well. And then they release that water back into the surface water. And as we know now, it's warmer and it can cause potentially a thermal pollution if it decreases the dissolved oxygen level you know, below the range of tolerance for the species that live there. Another instance of thermal pollution though could be urban runoff. And so think of a large parking lot with a lot of blacktop. It's gonna sit out in the sun all day and get pretty warm. When it rains, that water that passes over the blacktop and into storm drains is going to be a lot warmer than it was as rainwater. And it's going to be a lot warmer than the temperature of streams and rivers that those uh, you know, basins drain into or that those stormwater drains empty into. And so that can cause thermal pollution as well. A final example of thermal pollution that we should be really aware of in apes is nuclear power plants. So all power plants use water to turn, well not all power plants, but all combustion power plants use water to turn uh, into steam and then to turn a turbine, which powers a generator. But nuclear power, especially due to the intense heat that's released by nuclear fission, is going to use a ton of water to cool down the reactor core, prevent it from overheating, but also just, you know, to turn that water into steam, to turn a turbine, to power a generator, to make its electricity. 
And so we should know that nuclear power plants are an especially, um, potentially an especially big uh, source of thermal pollution. What we'll do though in the next slide in this video is focus on some ways that uh, this can be avoided using cooling towers. So as I mentioned, a cooling tower is a device that can be used to cool water, especially at a nuclear power plant, but really they can be used at any power plant or any industrial process that's you know, generating a lot of heat and using water to cool that heat down. So what's going to happen here is we're going to have the hot water coming from the industrial process. And you can see here that the water can kind of be sprinkled across uh, an exchange surface. We'll get a lot of airflow. That air will take some of the heat off of the water. And then we have cool water down in the basin that will also help to absorb some of the heat of that hotter water that was used in this industrial process. You know, it could be nuclear power generation, but it could be any sort of power generation that uses, you know, combustion or that uses um, a steam driven turbine. And so the trick here is that this cool water is going to eventually be either reused or released into a surface body of water. And so one thing I want to point out is that this is pretty standard procedure in power plants, um, nuclear power plants especially. And so if you're writing an FRQ, it might not be the best answer to say that a nuclear power plant should add cooling towers to limit thermal pollution because they probably already have them. But it's a little bit more accurate to maybe say that they could increase the efficiency of their cooling towers or hold water for a longer period of time before releasing it into surface bodies of water. And so again, cooling towers are, are pretty standard issue on nuclear power plants, but they can certainly be optimized. We could certainly hold the water for a longer period of time before it's discharged. And again, the main goal here is to get that water back down as close as possible to the temperature of the surface body of water it's being released into to minimize the effect of thermal pollution and decrease the risk of thermal shock to the organisms that live in that body of water. So for practice FRQ 8.6 today, I want you to explain how an increase in nuclear power generation in a town may lead to a decrease in biodiversity in nearby aquatic ecosystems.